right. So, um, before we start, well, before, yeah, before we start at all, um, this should be up on Blackboard for everybody, unless I missed a class somehow, which isn't impossible. Um, <clears throat> the basic topic, let me just move this over here so I can zoom in. Um, it's just going through chapter 19, the progressive era, and just choosing like a, an event or an individual or just something in that era that you think was interesting and writing about it. I mean, this is, for the reason I chose it personally is because that's where you had Theodore Roosevelt. And I, I wrote a lot about Theodore Roosevelt when I was little. Um, but you've also got, you know, Jane Addams, Hull House, Prohibition, um, Ida B. Wells, uh, W.B. Du Bois. Uh, this, when you have, you know, the, the city, the political machine bosses, all of that. So there's plenty you can write about um, in that era. Now, that said, you're welcome to go beyond that. You can expand into imperialism or do something else entirely. So you don't have to do the progressive era if you don't want to. You can go as far back as, well, don't go earlier than the, the Old West because that was the first paper. And you can go as late as, I mean, we're going to get to the Cold War-ish. I mean, I'm going to show you guys a documentary for the Cold War. So, you know, you can go that late. Um, but as usual, just like, let me know. Um, the paper's not going to be any different in terms of length. Um, I have here, this is, again, one of my older t classes, so the, the uh, language is a little bit different. Um, but I have here, the only sources required is the book. That is to say, if you don't use any outside sources, at least use the book. Um, but if you do use outside sources, you don't have to also rely on the book. So if you do just like the default stuff, at least use the book as like your source. But if you want to use outside stuff, that's typically preferable. And you don't, that is awesome. You don't also have to rely on the book um, if you use outside sources. That's just like bare bones. Uh, anyway, all this should be on Blackboard. Um, it's due our last day of class, which is the... Uh, um, 24th of April? Let me check. Yes, 24th of April. The last regular week is the week of the 17th, but we, we are going to be here on the 24th. Um, hopefully it's going to be when we're going to be watching the documentary, if we can get the timing right. Um, and yeah, so just FYI. All right. So uh, that's that. Let me see if I can grab it with my mouse. Yoink. Awesome. All right. Now, uh, any questions before we get back into the notes? I guess not. Um, to remind you guys, because this is a question I got last time, um, again, I do drop a grade, so... If you didn't do your first paper, uh, you, you're going to want to do the second paper, so I can drop that first paper. If you don't do either paper, I, there's a zero I can't drop. So, you know, do at least one of them. Um, if you somehow missed a test, uh, you're, you're going to want to do both of the papers, because then I can just drop the test. It means it's, it's all... Oh, you want to do the test? Um, it's all the it's all the same to me. Let me get this. No, it's fine. Well, actually, you know what? Let me. 
you just you just keep that one, and I'll get a new one for her. So yeah, you can just take it back to the testing center. There we go. You're good. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -da. Right. Um, yeah, grades. Make sure you don't miss more than one assignment because I can only drop one. I mean, try not to miss any. Best case scenario, don't miss any so I can drop the lowest. But if you're doing really well, then you can afford to not do one. But, you know. Um, yeah, so if you guys don't have any questions, we can get back into the material. What's up? Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, basically, the way I have it, it's I, I'm not. You, you don't exempt anything, but if you don't do the second paper, it's a zero, and I just drop it. So, yeah, if as long as you're happy with all your grades so far, you don't have to do the the second paper, and I'll just drop it. But if like you want one of your test grades dropped. Do that second paper so I have all the grades and then I'll just drop one of the tests. Yeah. Um, do, 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 do. For you, I think you're fine. <laughs> I mean, if you, if, you want, if you want to do the paper, you know, as like cushion in case, you know, you maybe don't do so well in the next test, which again, Pattern wise, you're doing fine. Um, also, I will just add to that um, since I need everybody to be here for the final exam, I can't drop the final exam. But if that's your lowest grade, I just won't drop anything so that everything will be weighed less. So rather than it being out of five, yeah. Rather than it being out of five grades, it'll be out of six, so they'll all be less percentage-wise, and you'll get the best possible grade. So that's how I that's how I do the math at the end of the semester. So if your final grade's your worst, and you've done all the other tests and the papers, then I just don't drop anything so that your final grade won't hurt as much, because the final grade weighs as much as everything else. It's not like fifty percent of your grade, which is dumb. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, but yes, good question. Um, anything else from anybody? Yes, never be afraid to ask questions. I'm sure someone else wanted to know. Okay. But yes, I do drop the, the lowest, so if, say, you had a bad first uh, test, um, just do the papers and the rest of the tests and I'll drop that first test. Or, you know, if you've been doing great, then you can rest towards the end of the semester and not do the second paper. All right. So th I believe this is where we ended it. Um, opening the door in China. Oh, I didn't change the title. I did a bad part three. All right. Okay. So we had uh, America getting involved in the Boxer Rebellion um, in order to basically exploit China as well as the rest of the European countries and Japan. Japan was getting involved too. Um, Russia invaded Manchuria, caused the Franco-Prussian War. Not Franco-Prussian War, that's dumb. Wrong war. The Russo-Japanese War. Um, and this concerned the Western powers because racism, 
They couldn't have Japan just like completely overrun Russia. Um, so eventually Roosevelt called a peace conference um, so that Russia wouldn't lose as much land, but Japan still did gain quite a bit in their victory. And then we had the dollars for bullets diplomacy uh, under Taft, uh, which more investment in the Caribbean and uh, South America, but also Nicaragua was basically controlled by big businesses because that's always a great idea. So we've got the various um, propaganda bits from that war. I didn't include the more uh, gruesome images from the Boxer Rebellion that I have in my European history class because, um, well, again, we weren't quite as involved as the Europeans were. And again, Japan. Japan was very involved in the Boxer Rebellion. All right, let's just go on to the next one. So. Uh, Roosevelt's out, Taft's out. Uh, they both tried to run again in 1912, but since they both were more or less the same party, they split the vote and Wilson ended up winning. So despite Wilson being very different from uh, Taft and especially Roosevelt, uh, he still ended up using Marines to protect American investments in Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Cuba. And then also there were issues with the American, with the Mexican Revolution. Um, this actually preceded Wilson's term uh, back in 1911, which I've got a silly image that kind of shows Taft handing that over to Wilson. Um, he withdrew to diplomatic recognition from Mexico after it refused to install leaders he considered good men because he just felt like America could decide who would be the leaders of a foreign country after it had a revolution, um, which was kind of something that France tried to do to us during our War of Independence. Um, but France wasn't quite as interested in sending their military over to force us to do a monarchy, I guess. Um, and if you're not familiar with what like the diplomatic recognition means in terms of uh, like newly formed countries, whenever there's like a rebellion or a civil war or like a, a, some kind of big political upheaval, Whenever a nation or a rebellion declares itself a new nation, uh, a foreign power has to diplomatically recognize it in order for it to receive diplomatic powers and trade deals and whatnot. Um, otherwise, it's just seen as a, an illegitimate power. Um, and Wilson actually used this to try to pressure Mexico into choosing leaders that he liked. And apparently diplomatic pressure wasn't enough because then he sent in uh, the Navy to Veracruz in April of 1914, which led to a clash that killed 19 Americans and 126 Mexicans because, you know, we can't do anything without killing a bunch of people. Um, so General Francisco Pancho Villa sent 1,500 troops over the border to attack Columbus, New Mexico. Uh, so Wilson responded and sent General John Pershing and 10,000 troops 300 miles into Mexico to try to get his hands on Villa, uh, which he never did. And they just sort of ran around inside Mexico burning villages and murdering civilians for several months. In fact, let me... Oh, several months, I'm sorry, several years, or at least a year. Yeah, July of, uh, no, six months, 
July of 1916, um, operation was a complete failure, only further angered Mexican leaders and confirmed their sense that Wilson had no respect for Mexican sovereignty. In January of 1917, Wilson ordered Pershing to withdraw his troops. Um, so yeah, things were not going so well in, well, between America and Mexico. And if you're familiar at all with like world events between, say, 1911 and 1917. Um, there was other stuff going on at this time, like, you know, a world war in Europe. So yeah, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated uh, August 4th, 1914, the Central Powers uh, Germany, the Ottoman Empire, and Austria-Hungary declared war on. They weren't technically the Allies; they were the Axis, not the Axis, the Entente, uh, France and Russia and Britain. Sort of joined. Uh, for our sake, since this is an American history class, we'll just say it was Britain, France, and Russia. Um, but technically, Britain was like an independent power. It just happened to be fighting Germany. Because Britain didn't want to uh, didn't want to side with France. Thank you. So technically, the United States was neutral for the first three years of this four-year war, much like with the Cuban War for Independence. Um, but as far as like which side we supported, it was very one-sided. Uh, Wilson considered the idea of a British defeat fatal to our form of government and American ideals. Um, we still had a lot of peace activists that wanted America to remain neutral. Um, Jane Adams, Carrie Chapman Catt, uh, they organized the Women's Peace Party. Uh, still one of the party's leaders, uh, Lucia True Ames Mead, um, which apparently is a name back then, uh, said there could be no peace until the military domination of Germany is destroyed. So, you know, despite we should stay out of the war, we were still like, hey, Britain should win and Germany should lose. But we've got, we're neutral technically, but we definitely are on one side and not the other. So here we have a depiction of how we saw the Mexican Revolution uh, supposedly running towards progress, but not making any headway. American, Mexican policy seems messy, but plenty of pepper will save it. Um, and the pepper being just add force to it. This is a real good image. Uh, Via running back into Mexico and Uncle Sam with this horrible goblin face. Um, saying, I've had about enough of this looking like an old man that's tired of kids on his lawn. He's got the shotgun. There's the weird maid Taft handing over that literally says here on the, the skirt Mexican situation uh, over to Wilson. Here's a good image. So here we have the Pershing Punitive Expedition, um, where Pershing is tied to a cactus. You have <laughs> you have Via uh, with throwing knives and a sombrero with a snake on it, and he's got knives like all over his belt. That is just like the most badass, 
like Mexican coated villain I've ever seen. It's so good. I don't know why he's got a a crutch. Uh, maybe he had a bum leg. I don't know. It's a whole thing. It's real funny. Anyway, Wilson steering us between war and intervention, yada, 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 towards justice, which I guess was sitting on our hands and doing nothing. Um, votes, vote for Wilson, who kept you out of the war. Right, so there was a... Um, there was an election in 1916, because, you know, the election that Wilson won was in 1912, and then the war started in 1914, and Wilson kept us out of war for two years, and so the, Wilson's big platform was, I've kept you out of the war that we already know is real bad, because, you know, when the war started, most Europeans were like, oh, this is going to be over in, you know, a few months, we'll be home by Christmas, no big deal. And then the trench warfare started. And, you know, Americans realized, oh, we don't want to be a part of that. Uh, however, here it's saying, uh, what's that? U boat, U boat blockading New York? Uh, tut tut, very inopportune. So, as someone from this particular magazine, not so, uh, not so into the anti war ideals of Wilson. So we have a lot of these. Uh, let's see, Women's Peace League. I always screw up the name. Women's Peace Party. I, again. Yeah, so got all that. Anyway. Um... We had two major problems when it came to neutrality. Uh, first off, as we said, we were a lot closer to uh, the Allies and the Central Powers, in particular, a lot closer to Britain than we were to Germany. Um, the Allies purchased $750 million in American goods, which quadrupled over the next four years. The Germans bought $350 million in 1914 and shrunk to $30 million by 1917. And there's a reason for that, which we'll get into here in a little bit. Um, also, loans, which is technically the same problem, um, at least according to the book. Uh, Wilson claimed loans were against the spirit of true neutrality, but within a year he allowed loans. By 1917, the Allies had $2.2 billion in loans, and the Germans were given $27 million in loans. Now... I mean, you know, this, this might just be me, but I feel like if you've got two sides that are relatively equal in strength going to war with each other and you're giving them both money, you're just extending the war. Um, you know, I mean, compared to, say, current events today where one power is supposedly several hundred times stronger. <laughs> um, and, you know, you, you, you support the, the power that's being attacked. Um, that's different than when you've got three major powers in Europe versus three other major powers in Europe. It just seems like sending them both money is just prolonging the war. Um, there was also the way the major powers in those alliances conducted the war. Uh, again, the British and Germans. So the British owned the ocean. Uh, other than the Battle of Jutland, which the Germans are still pretty proud of, um, because technically they weren't Nazis at the time, um, the Battle of Jutland was like a, was basically a draw. Uh, when we get to that in European history class, for those of you that are in here, um, we'll talk about that in greater detail. But it was a draw, and then the Germans went back to the ports, and um, the 
British set up a blockade and the German Navy never set sail again. Um, now, since the U.S. was a uh, neutral nation, they were allowed to ship non-war items into Germany. They were allowed to go past the blockade. Technically, by law, but the uh, British blockade still stopped American ships and wouldn't let them through, and Wilson just let that happen. Um, at the same time, Germany, having to adapt to the British blockade, uh, had developed the U-boat, as we're all pretty familiar with, uh, the Unterseeboot uh, to break this blockade. Now, international maritime law was, if you roll up on a civilian ship, a passenger ship, and you're pretty sure it's got munitions in it, because that's what countries would do, uh, you were to tell the passengers to get the hell off the ship, and then you would sink it. Um, if you're in a little U-boat, and that ship has munitions on it, but it also has military personnel who will shoot your ship, your little U-boat full of holes, um, surfacing and announcing your presence uh, usually wasn't best for your survival. So torpedoing a uh, passenger ship, even if it's full of munitions, um, was seen as being not in good taste. Uh, the Lusitania is the famous one, sunk by U boat, May 15th, 1915, killed about 1,200 people, 128 of them were Americans. That's the only ones we cared about. Um, many rallied for military action, like Roosevelt. Uh, Wilson, however, stuck to the peace policy, managed to win the 1916 election, um, but only after he demanded that Germans accept strict accountability and pay a settlement to the survivors. Um, I should mention that the Lusitania, despite being a passenger ship and also flying the American flag, um, was a British ship and its uh, cargo hold was full of military supplies, including firearms. So, you know, it was being used to transport actual weapons and they just put civilians on top of it to make a whole big deal out of this. So, you know, good work, Britain. This is the uh, the blockades. I just lost the word entirely. You've got the close blockade here, right on uh, Germany's main ports. A larger blockade out this way and then a much further blockade here and up at the North Sea. The North Sea blockade sucked. It's all icy and stormy like all the time. It's always stormy up in the North Sea. Here's the British and German um, uh, flotillas at the end of the war. Here's the U-boat doing its thing. Actually, I had a U-boat up out of the water. They were pretty uniquely shaped back here where the engines were. I think this one might be a World War II era one because it's got these uh, cannons on the back for dealing with aircraft. There's another one there. Actually, that one's got that's got a big old gun on the front. That's almost an anti-ship gun. That is an anti-ship gun. So there's Lusitania, more U-boats. I dare you to come out. The Kaiser defies American rights, national honor, freedom of the seas, international law, etc. cetera. 
Oh, right. So there were a bunch of Irish aboard the Lusitania as well. And they also used the sink of the Lusitania to try to get the Irish fighting in the war. Because at this time, the Irish were fighting really hard to get their independence from Britain. This was during the Easter Rising. And in response, Britain just like shelled the hell out of Dublin. Um, so Ireland wasn't fighting uh, in the First World War, not really. Um, and they try to use this to be like, oh, well, they killed your, your countrymen. It's like, yeah, because you put munitions in the boat, guys. There again, more, more propaganda. More propaganda. There's a whole lot of propaganda for the Lusitania. Here's an actual like newspaper flipping. Saying it's something about submarine, probably 1,260 dead, twice torpedoed off the Irish coast, yada yada. Liberty bond shot. It. Every Liberty bond is a shot at a U-boat. Here's the thing. Um, they, I, I don't know what they're trying to do with the German accent, but basically, whose boat is that? It says, can't you see him? A blue and Yankee, and it's got Lusitania there on the back. John Bull uses the American flag for protection. So, like, people understood what was going on, even if we were using it to fuel outrage against um, Germany. All right. So, January 22nd, 1917, back to Wilson. Um, need a peace without victory. Neither side wished to end the war that so many had sacrificed themselves for. Um, 1915 and 16, Germany pledged to not use the U boat to keep the US out of the war. But by February uh, of 17, they continued to use unrestricted warfare. Um, which is to say the U-boats were just going to hit anything that was floating. February 24th, 1917, the British intercepted the Zimmerman telegram from the German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmerman, offered Mexico an alliance if the U.S. joined the Allies, and also Mexico would get uh, Texas, New, Z New Mexico, and Arizona if the Central Powers won. Uh, obviously, once this was given to the newspapers, uh, people were very against neutrality uh, because, I mean, in 1917, we, were, we had just, like, finished, we had just pulled Pershing out of Mexico. Um, so the, opinion was, the opinions against Mexico were still pretty, pretty sour. Um, and the idea that Germany was like offering parts of America to Mexico if they joined the Central Powers. Um, we weren't real cool with. So February, March, more American ships were sunk. Uh, it should be mentioned that these were armed American merchant ships, like they were specifically uh, outfitted to fight back against U-boats and military ships. So this wasn't like more Lusitanias that were supposedly defenseless passenger ships. These were specifically taking supplies to Britain. Uh, so by April, Wilson asked Congress to declare war. Uh, they debated for four days and approved the resolution. However, the U.S. wanted to, maintain, to stay away from entangling alliances, which is what largely caused the First World War. Um, so much like with Britain, we didn't technically join the Allies. Um, we joined in as an associated power um, that we kind of did our own thing uh, and weren't bound by any treaties or 
uh, initiatives that they signed. Uh, still though, as we saw with even going to war against Spain, um, we didn't have a huge standing army at the time, so it took a little while to get troops together and trained and sent over the Atlantic. Um, so the first major thing we did was send American warships over to fight German U-boats with the British. Uh, the Bolshevik Revolution happened, which caused Russia to pull out of the war um, and allowed for Germany to focus all its strength on the uh, Western Front, leading to a, let's see, we have two-month battle in the Argonne Forest. Uh, eventually, though, the Allies broke through and began marching towards Germany, and Germany finally did surrender in November of uh, 1918. November 11th, 1918 specifically, um, but that's... Uh, that's the, the cliff notes. The next several, well, literally the rest of the chapter is about the home front because that's um, more of what we got into. So, we got this. Uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas for Mexico, the rest for myself. I don't know why it has California for Japan, because Japan was allied with um, Britain in World War I. They were like keeping, I mean actually they, had, they took several uh, holdings from Germany in the Pacific um, during the First World War. So not sure what that's about. There's the Zimmerman note exploding in uh, the Kaiser's hands. And even though this one's in French, um, I do love the, the image of like this ghostly Uncle Sam angrily shaking his fist across the ocean as Lusitania sinks. There's just your typical American warship. Um, if you remember the ones from back in like the 1890s, uh, these ships look a bit more modern. They're not quite as rounded. They don't like they'll tip over in a light breeze. Um, they're 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 a bit more sturdy, a bit more angular. Um, they still have the big ass smokestacks though. So we're, we're we're getting towards what we consider modern battleships. There's our boys, about to go live in the trenches for a couple of months. There's the German being a gorilla, I guess. Destroy this mad brute, enlist. There he's got the culture stick, I guess. I know we were anti-German for a while. There's no man's land. This is the wasteland in between the two trenches. Um, there's still large regions of France that you can't go to um, because there's just there's still unexploded ordnance like buried down in the ground. Um, and even I mean, they're like still digging it out and um, disarming it or exploding it so that it won't explode by accident. Uh, but even then, like you can't live there because the chemicals from the explosives and the various poison gas of the war has leached down into the water table and it's just poisoned whole regions of France. So there's there's big parts of the of the country you just can't go to, even though the war happened a hundred plus years ago now. 
Speaking of water, here's probably a real safe watering hole. There's the end of the war. It's Holland's problem. Kaiser, Crown Prince, and Hindenburg go to Holland because they were technically neutral. Right, so the main part of the remainder of this chapter is the, the home front. Because while we did lose, you know, 50, according to the book, 50,000 uh, troops died, a good roughly a quarter of a million were injured and, you know, suffered various levels of PTSD after returning home. Um, shell shock, as it was called back then. Um, the biggest change really happened at home due to how much the country had to adjust to such a large-scale war, despite only being in it for like a year. Um, so women went to work to uh, replace the men who had been sent overseas. Um, media was often co-opted for propaganda. Uh, progressive government business practices was were used during the Great War. Wilson created the War Industries Board to supervise purchase of military supplies, uh, ensure private industries could meet demand. This was, I guess you'd consider the very beginning of the military industrial complex. Certainly not what we'd see, you know, by the end of World War II and especially during the Cold War. Um, but this was sort of the start of it. It didn't really do much until March of 1918 um, when the Wall Street financier Bernard Baruch, I guess is how his name is pronounced, uh, took over. Labor mobilized, National War Labor Board. Um, they continued to use the National War Labor Board even outside of times of war to take advantage of the laws put in place during the war. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. Uh, settle labor disputes, avoid strikes, attain an eight hour work day, time and a half for overtime, labor's right for collective bargaining. Um, they were not able to achieve equal pay for equal work for women because 1918, I guess. Um, more than a million women did take up jobs that were normally seen as being for men because, again, men were largely sent off to the front lines. This wasn't quite the time of Rosie the Riveter. Again, that's more World War II. Um, but this is just that in a smaller scale. This is proto... Um, well, this is just, again, a smaller scale of what we would see later. Lots of federal agencies either became tooled for um, the war or were created for the war. Herbert Hoover, a name we're going to see so many times until the end of the semester, <laughs> um, became head of the Food Administration, increased food supply with voluntary food conservation, children planting vegetable gardens, uh, Hoover felt this was just as real and patriotic an effort as the building of ship or the firing of cannon. Um, pretty much every new federal agency we're going to see from now until the end of World War II, Hoover's going to be in charge of, it's real weird. It's like he took every federal job he could until he became president. Also, railroads regulated to make sure that troops and supplies were efficiently moved from place to place. You know, unlike if you ever try to take Amtrak now and you're going down the line and then you just stop for three hours because a freight train decided it wanted to go first. So you've got the Philadelphia Council of Defense, where industry needs water, protect production, use it wisely. So, you know, conserve water, don't just leave faucets running, 
I mean, do that anyway, because we are sort of running out of fresh water. Help Uncle Sam stamp out the Kaiser, buy government bonds. There's a lot of these government bond things. Which, if you're not familiar with what government bonds are, it's basically you're buying a piece of paper and giving money to the government for, um, typically for the war. And the bonds are supposed to appreciate in value, so the longer you hold on to them, the more they're worth, and then you can sell those bonds back to the government and make that money back in the future. A lot of those don't turn out to work quite as well as they're supposed to. Don't waste paper. Paper was a big deal. Help stop this uh, National War Savings Committee, so I guess these are more bonds. On the job for victory, United States Shipping Board, Emergency Fleet Corporation. That's like a 1918 pneumatic hammer, I guess. Some kind of, um, or like a riveter. That's pretty cool. Slap those ships together and hope for the best. This is World War II. Together we can do it, labor and management. You can tell by the tank and the very advanced airplane down there. That ain't World War One. Uh, fight or buy bonds. Either you go over there and you shoot at people or you buy bonds. Here's what Hoover was in charge of. Uh, food, buy it with thought, cook it with care, use less wheat and meat, buy local food, serve just enough, use what is left. Don't waste it. Don't waste food. I, um, my grandfather was in World War II, and my grandmother grew up during the Great Depression, so like I was raised on do not waste food. What is wrong with you? I will beat you senseless. So yeah, wasting food is like a cardinal sin. Save a loaf a week. Help win the war. Wheat was a big deal because it was easy to transport, so it was easy to send over with the troops to, to help feed them. We eat because we work. U.S. School Guard Army. Oh, wait, is this? Here it is. I had to tell my last class the thing. Okay. Follow the Pied Piper, join the United States School Guard and Army. How many of you are familiar with the actual story of the Pied Piper? Great. So, if I remember right, the Pied Piper was one of the Brother, Brothers Grimm fairy tales, which should go ahead and tell you what we're about to get ourselves into. Um, long story short, there was a village like overrun with rats, and this dude could play his pipe, and the rats would follow him, and he led them out of the village, or if I remember correctly, like led them into the river to drown. Um, and the village people refused to pay him because they were just a bunch of cheap assholes. So he used his magical pipe to lead the children out of the village and into the woods, and the children were never seen again. So when you see weird stuff like this, follow the Pied Piper, that's a warning. You don't do that. That's like, yeah, trust the wolf in grandma's clothing. <sighs> anyway. And I, I, and I told my class yesterday, too, it's like, if they can make a freaking stupid Winnie the Pooh horror movie, they need to make a Pied Piper horror movie, because that was actually a horror story, where he just leads the children out into the woods, and they're never seen again. Anyway. Um... All that said, <laughs> um, I enjoy going into old fairy tales. Uh, 
Just because the United States is at war doesn't mean everybody agrees with the war now. Um, Wilson created the Committee on Public Information, led by the Denver journalist George Creel, to create propaganda and inspire patriotic fervor. They encourage report, reporters to censor their war coverage, create film reels that show the allies of savage civilization, center powers of savage beasts. Um, again, my European class, we're gonna get, once we get into World War I, um, the Battle of the Somme um, was a major British offensive. This was before America actually got involved, so you guys don't actually need to know this, but just to give you guys a little uh, context, the Battle of the Somme was this major British offensive. They, they brought in artillery shells for like a week. Um, or no, they brought in, they shipped in artillery shells for like a month. And then for almost a week straight, they just shelled the, um, the German uh, trenches. And then after a week of shelling, they charged over their side and ran towards the, the German trenches. Little did they realize the German trenches were deeper than they expected and the places where the machine guns were set up were more fortified. And so the Germans just popped back up, set up the machine guns and began gunning down the British. The entire time the British press were filming, expecting this to be like this triumphant victory for the British. And they just sent the film reels back to London completely uncut uh, and showed them in theaters all throughout the city. And it led to like riots and people passing out in theaters because they're watching their boys get shot to pieces in the fields. Um, so immediately they're like, oh, we need to actually like maybe edit some of this before we share it with the general public. So, yeah, Britain found that out the hard way. Um, so just like censoring and editing war coverage wasn't enough, where the Espionage Act of 1917 prohibited anti-war activities, interfering with the draft, mailing publication, advocating forcible intervention, a year later, Sedition Act punished individuals, uh, expressed beliefs disloyal to or abusive to the American government, flag, or military uniform. Boy, these sound familiar for those of you that were in my American history class last year, last semester. Um, if you spoke out against the war, many were brought to trial, like Eugene V. Debs. Hey, look, he's back one more time. Yeah, one more time. Um, he was sentenced to 10 years, but was pardoned after three for saying that the draft was a form of slavery because, you know, you were forced to fight in a war that you didn't believe in. American Protective League, this was basically anti-German prejudice, but like government mandate. Um, they worked with the Bureau of Investigation, which later became the Federal Bureau of Investigation, in case you needed that spelled out for you. Um, they basically spied on any German residents suspected of being spies for the enemy. Essentially, anybody that spoke German or um, partook in native customs were seen as being not true Americans. You know, because why not? Even though German uh, ancestry was like the largest portion of Americans at the time. So we have U.S. Bishop War pictures. Imagine logging that thing around. In fact, I don't remember the name of the game. There's this, I think it's a, I mean, it's clearly, it's, it's multiplayer. It's a, like a World War II multiplayer shooter, but you can actually play as the person taking the pictures. <laughs> taken with, cam with the camera and trying to record everybody else fighting. And you do get points based on like the composition. It's a whole thing. Eat more cottage cheese. Blech. I'm not a, not a fan of that. This, this is actually in the book, 
gee, I wish I were a man, I'd join the Navy. Naval Reserve or Coast Guard. Um, the book actually, the, the one on the book actually says, be a man and do it, United States Navy Recruiting Station. Um, I knew some guys that were in the Navy. I worked with them in, uh, when I was working at GE. I, I think she'd be just fine in the Navy. Buy Liberty Bonds. Ple I pledge allegiance and silence about the war. Don't say things about the war. This is obviously during Vietnam, but same idea. Don't, don't register for the draft. This is the same image I used last semester with the sedition acts of like Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> This is technically the sedition bills that are being used post-World War I um, because we had the Red Scare, uh, two drastic sedition legislation, swap the fly but use common sense. You'll get the fly on your forehead, but if you're using a sledgehammer, you might get a little bit more than the fly. I really like the way his, um, his goatee is drawn here. Very fluffy. I also like how this is just written in the newspaper. One of the most nearly perfect systems of secret service work ever launched with the wealth and brains of Chicago and the country behind it has its origin in Chicago. Cool. But it's like, hey guys, there's a secret thing happening. We're going to tell everybody about it. You, you, you sure? German government marshals being around up pro Germans. You know, any disloyalty must cease. Oh, yeah, this is like disloyalty includes like strikes in uh, production because you're seen as like delaying um, production of war material. So you're helping. The Kaiser or whatever. And I just threw this in because, I don't know, I found it years ago and thought it would fit. Did I? No. Um... We will, because this is actually where my Tuesday Thursday class is, so we're going to stay on uh, the same pace, and we'll continue, uh, today's Wednesday, next week. So we'll finish up the chapter with uh, Waging Peace um, on Monday. Oh. <coughs> Come on now. <laughs>